Hi everyone. Today's lecture is just a continuation of chapter 3. So in the first part of chapter 3 we talked about uh, the structures of metals and the structures of ceramics and their densities and how the bonds of these metals and ceramics um, help us to describe how they pack, how they arrange themselves and essentially what their densities end up being. And all of that was just descriptive of, you know, these are where the atoms are located and so on and so forth. So in this part of the lecture, we're actually going to focus on the concept of the unit cell and its geometry using numbers. And the objectives here are going to be to be able to describe the direction in a unit cell um, because remember, the unit cell contains our atoms, it describes where the atoms are located, and then from that is how we were able to figure out, okay, you know, this is in the corner, so it's an A, this is in the face, so it's a half, and so on and so forth. So what we'd like to do now is take these unit cells, put them within a certain um, set of axes, and then describe directions within them, and once we know those directions, we can figure out, um, you know, what what's parts of the of the units are actually most relevant. The other thing is we're also going to be able to describe one planes. Okay, so your vectors are one dimension, your planes are two dimensional spaces within your units on how we describe that. And we're going to focus exclusively for this particular lesson on cubic unit cells. So we won't be talking too much about the hexagonal close packed for instance. So the shapes you'll be most concerned about are your cubic unit cells where all your three sides are the same. So after this lesson, you'll be able to sketch a vector direction and what that means and sketch a plane within a unit cell if you're given the numbers, which are these indices that represent that unit cell. Then you would also be able to, if you're given a specific direction or a specific unit cell, be able to figure out what those numbers are. So in one way, you're going to start from the numbers and sketch. And then in the other point, you're going to be able to look at a, a diagram and get the numbers from that. And then finally, now that once we get what a sense of this one dimensional and two dimensional descriptors are, which are vectors and planes respectively, then we'll be able to figure out how to calculate the densities on those lines and those planes. So you can't, you start to see how, you know, when we start with the cube, for instance, we can calculate what we call the volume density. And then when we look at the plane, we can calculate what we call the planar density. And when we look at the line, we can calculate what the linear density will be. And so the first thing we'll do is start with directions. And so what I'm going to do with this video is I'm going to actually split it up into two parts. So the first half, so it's like part two is going to be broken up into part two A and then part two B. So the first part will focus, which is what you're watching right now, is going to focus on vectors, okay, and linear densities. And then the second part will focus on planes and planar densities. The whole goal is just to make the video short enough that you can take it in and, you know, um, not fall asleep. No guarantees on that, though. So let's begin. So the first thing we'll talk about are crystallographic systems and points within those systems. And I'll just try to remind you that there were two concepts that came up or two terminologies that came up in the last um, subsection. So chapter three, part one. I talked about the unit cell being the smallest unit of the building block of your crystal structure, such that if we describe the unit cell, then we can once we describe the unit cell, we pretty much know what the overall crystal structure of that particular material is. It's like, again, going back to what we talked about with the chessboard or a checkers board and using one square there to define the rest of the space. The other thing was the concept of a lattice. And so these lattices or lattice points, to be more specific, are the positions that we use to designate where the atoms are. So if I draw a unit cell, for instance, and I put some points in there, I put those points to represent positions where I expect the atoms to be. And I mentioned that there are a variety of these crystal systems, you know, cubic, hexagonal, tetragonal, and so on and so forth, and they're basically differentiated by um, the relationships of the axes, so the length of these sides, right? And they're also differentiated by the angles as well. So for instance, again, cubic and tetragonal, the difference is that for your tetragonal, one of the sides is different than the other two. And then if we go from like cubic to robohedral, for instance, all your sides are the same, but then one of your angles is different from 90 degrees in comparison to the cubic. So again, these are the different types of crystal systems. You don't have to memorize them, but the main one we'll focus on here 
will be the cubic one because it's the simplest. And if we use that, we can figure out what the rest look like. And so our crystal systems, we will describe them, and the cubic ones specifically are described with respect to a certain coordinate system, which are typically x, y, and z, as you've seen in more uh, mathematics. Okay, Not always Cartesian, because sometimes we have to deal with, so if I go back one slide, sometimes we have to deal with hexagonal systems, which are not um, Cartesian, but in this case, we're going to be dealing with Cartesian systems. And we have this concept of your lattice constants, okay, which are representative of the sides of this unit cell. So again, in the on the x-axis, my lattice constant for this unit cell is described by the letter A. On the y-axis, my lattice constant is defined by the letter B. And on the z-axis, my lattice constant is defined by the letter C. Okay, and these lattice constants are descriptive of the edge length of the unit cell. Okay, so we take our unit cell, we put it into a certain coordinate system, and then we can now start to assess positions within that unit cell. Okay, so we already know, for instance, that for, for all the unit cells that we described, there's always going to be um, your atoms located in the corners, right, based on the ones we talked about. So simple cubic, body center cubic, face center cubic, all of those have um, atoms or special positions in the corners, okay? And so our coordinates are going to be based on our x, y, and z axis, such that if I said I have a point that is 0, 0, 0, from mathematics, remember that that represents the origin, which is that location there where um, the position along the x axis is 0, the position along the y axis is 0, and the position along the z axis is 0. On the other hand, if I were to look at this blue point, this blue point is at the opposite end of the 0, 0, 0, point coordinates, right? So this point here on the corner here is designated as 111 because it is one unit along the x-axis, right? One unit along the y-axis and one unit along the z-axis and that's how I get this position here, okay? And so if I now take my BCC or my body center cubic, for instance, and I represent where those atoms are located with lattice points, I would have the structure that looks like this on the right-hand side, where you notice that for body-centered, as the name tells us, is an atom within the body of that unit cell. And so I have my special positions at the corners, right? And then I have this position represented by five in the center, which is the lattice point for my body-centered atom. And what you can use to describe that is that because this, this actual point is in the middle of the cell, so halfway along the X, halfway along the Y, halfway along the Z, that uh, position or the coordinate for that position would be one half, one half, one half. So each of these positions here, right, from one, two, three, four, five, all the way to nine, all of those are special positions within my body centered cubic, which will have special or specific set of coordinates. The other thing we should think about is that, again, everything we're talking about is within the concept of the unit cell. And sometimes when we're given a position, that position may be outside of our unit cell and it's going to be another identical unit cell as well. And typically what we would have to do is translate that point. The point I'm trying to make here is that this, for instance, imagine that I'm looking from the top, right? So I'm looking down. Let me correct that. I'm looking from the front of this unit cell. So if I'm looking at the front of this unit cell, I don't really see my x-axis. What I see is my z and my y. And this point here will represent like four different unit cells stacked on top of each other. And if I am in this position here, and then I move that position a length b, so one unit cell from this direction to here, and I translate it by one complete unit cell, this second position is the exact same as this one because these two unit cells are identical. And that's going to be important when we start talking about concepts where we have to draw um, directions that start in one unit cell and go to another. Okay, so again, we've talked about the unit cell as, as what we're going to focus on. The lattice points represent the positions of our atoms. And now we're going to start to talk about our directions. Okay, so a direction, right, if you just think back to either physics or math, a direction is typically represented by a line, or to be more specific, by a vector, which we've taken a line and put a arrowhead on top of it. Okay, and so we call these 
crystallographic directions because they're directions within our crystal structure. And so the first thing we're going to do is figure out how we determine these directions. Okay, And these directions are numerically described by something known as Miller indices. So a Miller index is one number, and we have one number per axis, and so we have a bunch of indices. Okay, So let's look at this um, so system here. So we have our x, y, and z axis, right? We know that that's our position. We have the black box here representing our unit cell. And then we've drawn a dotted um, unit cell behind that. So usually when we have like negative values, for instance, or something that we can't see or something that's behind, we represent that as this dotted line. But the main unit cell that we're dealing with is this particular one in the solid black. Okay. And then we have this green arrow coming from this point all the way out here. Okay, so this here represents a direction within that unit cell. So how do we determine what that direction is actually stating? And so this is the methodology in which we would do that. So the first thing we would do is um, we may need to reposition the origin, for instance. So if we look at this unit cell, we've already figured out that based on where our x, y, and z are, this position here where this red dot is, represents the origin, right? Is where all my axis originates from. And so that's my zero, zero, zero. So normally we may have some vectors, I won't say normally, because you know it varies. Sometimes we'll have vectors that do not start at the origin, but this particular one does. And because it does, we don't need to reposition that. Okay? So our origin is going to be zero, zero, zero. So we're good in that in that regard. The next thing we need to do is figure out what the projections of the vector of the vector is in terms of a, b, and c. So remember a, b, and c represents the lengths along the x, y, and z axes respectively. And so when we say read off the vector projections, what we're going to do is say, all right, so I'm sorry, not the origin. Let's figure out what the length of that vector is in the x direction, which will be um, re relative to the a, in the y direction, which is relative to b, and the z direction, which will be relative to c. So let's begin. So we learned that this vector goes from here all the way to this length. So if I'm moving along the x-axis, I have to cover the full length of the x-axis, mainly because this particular vector goes all the way to the end. All right. So the projection along the x will be a full length of the unit cell, and we'll call that 1a. It's one because it's a full length, right? Because the unit cell, so every every edge on that cell is has one unit or a unit, okay? And A, because we're moving along the x-axis, and notice that it's also positive, therefore, because we're moving along the positive um, x-axis. Then we'll read off the, um, the projection in the y direction. So if we notice, this particular vector does not move left, um, right or left, right? And because it doesn't move right or left, there is no projection in the y direction, and so it would be 0b because it doesn't move along this direction at all. And then finally, I'm at this point again, I've moved along the x, I don't need to move along the y uh, because it doesn't move along the y, and the last thing I need to do is move along the z to complete it to get it to the final point. And so I would move a full length up. Again, when I do that, Oh, sorry, not a full length up because a full length up would be all the way here. I only move halfway, roughly, right? You can estimate that just based on the eye test. All right, so we'll move halfway from here to here. And so that would be one half C. C because this is the Z direction, one half because I only go half a unit up. All right, so now I have these three numbers. Okay, so my projections are defined by, and I enrich them X, Y, and Z. So my projections are one, zero and one half, which are these numbers over here. Okay, so we we've taken care of number two. The next thing we need to do is take care of number three, which says to simplify to obtain the smallest integer values. And so what that means is that we want integers. Our indices have to be integers, okay? And so we either divide or multiply to get the simplest term. So if we look at this, I have one, zero, and one half, and I don't, I don't want fractions of my indices, so I need to get rid of that. And the way to do that is I'm going to have to multiply everything here by 2. Okay, so that's what point 3 is saying. Convert, I multiply everything by 2. And when I convert, I get 1 times 2, which is 2, 0 times 2, which is 0, 1 half times 2, which is 1. Okay, so these 
r, uh, this is the result from this last step. And then finally, our vectors are um, denoted with square brackets. So we're going to take these three numbers and put them in square brackets with no commas. So I'm going to get um, open square brackets, two, zero, one, and close square brackets. And so you will end up with that. Okay. Very important. The way we differentiate in this class or in material science between vectors and any other any other three set of numbers is by using square brackets. All right. That's going to come up on a quiz or on an exam or homework. So make sure you note that. Okay. So that is how the methodology will follow. So we're going to do another example. Uh, we'll work that out and then we'll do we'll do a few more. Okay. So again, the summary is this: reposition. Read out the projections, simplify if need be, put in uh, and close in square brackets. So in this next one, we have a similar system, right? We have well, a similar system only because we have the positive um, unit cell and then we have a unit cell behind it. But we have this red vector here, which now starts over here in the origin, but goes all the way back. Okay, so again, we're going to follow the same methodology. The first thing we need to do is figure out if we need to reposition. Okay, so that's a question for you to think about. And don't think about it too hard because our origin is always here and we only reposition if the tail of the vector is not at the origin, which it is, so we don't need to reposition. So we're good. The next step is to read out the vector projections along the A, B, and C. So again, we start with X, Y, and Z, mainly because our indices are X, Y, and Z. So I want to go from this end to this end and I can only move along the X, Y, and Z directions. So when I look at this, the first thing I would do is say, well, this vector goes backwards. And so to get from here to there in the x direction, I'm going to have to go back one unit. And so I'm going to go back one. All right. And so now my projection is negative 1a. Negative 1 because I go back a full length. Okay. And then I'm going to go along the y direction and I have to go all the way across to here. So that is going to be 1b. Okay, so I go all the way back and all the way to the right. And then finally, I'm going to go all the way up 1. So I go all the way up 1 and that's going to be 1c. So my numbers or my projections are negative 1, 1, and 1. Which is what this says, negative 1, 1, and 1. And then we want to simplify if we need to, but if you look at this, there's only to simplify it because all of these are in integer forms. And so we end up with the same thing, nothing changes. And then final thing we need to do is enclose in brackets. Now you're gonna see something slightly different. That is going to be our solution. But notice that this negative one here, there's no negative one, there's no negative out here. What actually happens is we put that negative value on the top. And so this now becomes one over bar one, one. So anytime you have a negative index, you represent that with an over bar. And again, we close it with square brackets. So with that, I would suggest look up multiple examples online. Try as much as possible to practice these because you're going to see just a few here in the notes. But there's books I suggested, so make sure you go and practice that. Okay, so the, I'm going to show you one question, which I'm going to show you the solution of. But I would like you to um, think about it, okay, based on what we talked about. So, you know, this would be a good time to... Um, stop the video, right? Look at the question you're asked and then see if you can solve it based on what you have covered in the previous slides. Okay, so this is why I provide you guys two sets of slides. So I'm going to take a brief moment here. Pause. Um, I would ask you to pause and then try to solve it. So in this question, we're going to be finding the Miller indices for vector C, which is the yellow vector here. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you two possible ways to do it. I'm going to show you the first one, which I showed in the previous two examples, and I'm going to show you an alternative method. So let's begin. So the first step is to reposition the vector if need, to reposition the origin rather if need be. So I look at my unit cell, I see that uh, my origin is over here, which is again the beginning of x, y, and z, and I notice that my vector which is this yellow one, is not situated. The tail of my vector is not situated at 0, 0, 0. So I'm going to move my origin from here 
to over here. So all that means is that I'm not moving the whole unit cell. All it means is that now this here is my zero, zero, zero point. Okay, so we place it at the base and now you notice that I have this yellow zero here or yellow O here representing my, um, my origin. And then the next thing we do is project along the um, X, Y, and Z direction or A, B, and C. Okay, so the first thing you will notice is that I want to go from this point all the way here. Okay, so we're going to start with the X and you notice that this vector is moving forward. So I'm going to go from this point and I have to go forward in the X direction represented by that dotted yellow line. Okay, and because I went from a point, this point here is noted by half half, so I've moved a length of a half here, so that's just something to think about and note in your head that this is half for your x. All right, and then from here, I'm going to move all the way to the right. And again, I've moved a halfway to the right based on my original position. And finally, I'm gonna move all the way up. Okay, so I've moved forward, half, right by half, and up one, and that gives me these projections. Okay, so those are my projections, and so the numbers I'm dealing with are one half, one half, and one. And so the next step is to convert if need be. Convert meaning I go from whatever numbers I have to integers, or I simplify if my numbers are all um, can be simplified. And so I have one half, one half, one half, and I want integers, so I'm gonna multiply each of these by two. So 1 half times 2, 1 half times 2, 1 times 2. That's the lowest number I can multiply to get integers. When I do that, I get my vectors, or rather my directions or my projections as 1, 1, 2. And the final step is to put it in brackets, which gives me that, 1, 1, 2. So again, just to note the things we did differently here, or the things to keep in mind, rather, is number one, we had to reposition the origin to the tail, which was over here, and then we use square brackets to denote the vector. Okay, so this method I use if you're graphically or uh, visually inclined, but some people just wanna do math, and so this next method I'm gonna use will be based solely on just doing math to solve the problem. And so again, we're solving the, we're solving for the indices, or well, we're trying to figure out what the indices of the C vector are, okay? So in this particular method, you don't need to move the origin at all. So keep the origin as is, which is your zero, 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 and then let's begin. So this is zero, zero, zero here. So the first thing we can do is, let's find the coordinate of the arrowhead. So this is the arrowhead over here, all the way up in this corner. And from what we did before, but even if you don't remember, this corner here is all the way at this end, right? And how do I get up here? I go all the way forward, I go all the way right, and then I go all the way up. So this point here has a coordinate of 1, 1, 1. So that's a coordinate of the arrowhead, all right? And then I find the coordinate. The next point is to find the coordinate of the arrow tail, all right? So the, the coordinate of this particular point. Again, remember, we didn't move the origin, so everything is relative to this 0, 0, 0 point here. So this is on the floor of the box, and it's in the center on the floor. So we have an x coordinate that is a half, a y coordinate that's a half, and a z coordinate that is zero. Okay, zero because this is on the floor of our unit cell. So step four, we take the difference between the head and the tail. Always remember that it's head minus tail. Where we end up minus where we start with. So it's one, 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 minus one half, one half, zero. And so you do x minus x, y minus y, z minus z. So one minus one half is one half, 1 minus 1 half is 1 half, and 1 minus 0 is 1. Okay, you say Z in the US, people in, in the UK say Z. So that's what we end up with. 1 half, 1 half, and 1. And so our projections, again, we go back to this point, which is our projections are 1 half, 1 half, 1, and then everything else continues from there. So we convert, okay, to integers by multiplying by 2, and then... We put in brackets, or square brackets rather, which gives us the one, one, two. So you can use either of these two methods, 
whichever one you prefer, whichever one works best for you is what I would suggest. But again, um, it's really up to you. I'm, I'm method ag agnostic in this class, so whatever your preference is, what you work with. All right, so that is how we um, figure out the indices from the vectors. And I would encourage you, if you want to practice, to look and think about what the values for your D, A, and B are. And I will discuss that in class so I can provide the solutions later on, but make sure you work on that. The other thing we want to do is, now, what if we are given the indices and we need to sketch? And so you would go backwards, okay, and from what we did in the lecture notes. All right, so what do we do? We reposition the origin, right? We figure out what the projections are, we simplify, and then we enclose in square brackets. So this one will go in the backward direction. So rather than simplifying, we look at our numbers. If, if, remember, we're dealing with unit cells here. So we want all our numbers, all our indices, to be less than or equal to 1. So the first thing we may need to do is divide through so all the numbers are less than or equal to 1 and divide by the same number throughout, okay? And you'll see an example in the next slide. And then draw your unit cell, okay? And so you can either, you may need to draw an additional negative unit cell. I'll explain what that means in a second. Or in an alternative method, you don't, we do everything within one unit cell, which is typically easier and quicker because that way you're not drawing multiple boxes, okay? And then we start from the origin and move along the x-axis based on the first index, move along the y-axis based on the second index, move along the z-axis based on the third index, and that gives us our final point, and we just join from the beginning to the end, and then we're good. Okay, so let's begin. We are going to sketch this vector in a unit cell. And so our vector is 2 over bar 1, 2. All right, so this 2 over bar here means that I have, what, a negative index, and these are both positive. Okay, so again, go back to the instructions on the other side to figure out, because you want to use that to figure out how we work through this. And so the first thing I'll do is if I look at this, all of these, like two of these numbers are bigger than one, and so I want my biggest number to be one. Okay, so what I'll do is divide through here by two. Okay, so if I divide negative two by two, I get negative one. If I divide one by two, I get one half. If I divide 2 by 2, I get 1. So my projections along the x, y, and z axis are going to be negative 1, 1 half, and 1. Okay, so those are my x, y, and z there. All right, so those are, those are, the, those are the projections you want to keep in mind because that's what we're going to be working with when we start to sketch. So in the first method I'm going to show you, right, this is the first method where we have to actually draw additional unit cells, okay? And the reason for that is because anytime you have a negative number, that means that you're not in the original unit cell that we typically draw. You're going to be in another unit cell outside of that. And because this value here is negative, which re this index here is our x, um, represents our x direction, and it's negative, so we're going to draw x additional unit cell. I'm going to draw one that is going to be behind this unit cell because this is the negative x and positive x is out of the page or out of the screen, negative x will be behind. And so we draw that unit cell behind. Okay, so now we have that unit cell and then we're going to follow the steps that we typically follow. So again, we have this unit cell, we have this negative unit cell here. This is our origin and now we're going to go along our x, our y, and our Z axis. So from before, remember that we, we took these numbers and we divided through by 2. So my x is going to be, my x projection is negative 1. Okay. So we start with this as the origin. And because we are going in the negative direction for x, instead of coming forward, we go backwards along that length. And so our first part is we start here, we go negative 1, which all goes all the way back. And then we divide it through by two, so our y is one half. So we go, and it's positive, so we go to the right one half. And then our z, again, we divide it through by two, so our z is one, and so we go up one. So we have that. So now our vector is going to be starting from where we started with, which is the origin and ending over here. Okay, so this is the tail of our vector, 
this is the head of our vector. When we do that, we get that. Okay. So remember, because of this negative number, we had to draw an additional unit. So that's an extra one, two, three, four. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? An extra eight lines. Now, if you do the quiz on exam, those extra eight lines or extra time is precious. So rather than doing all that, what I'd like to show is we have an alternative method where we don't have to draw multiple unit cells. We just stick with one unit cell and work with that. And so you might ask, well, how do we figure out a negative direction if we have a single unit cell? So what we do there is rather than creating another unit cell, we move our origin within our one unit cell that we have. So this unit cell we start with, all right? Notice that the x is negative, all right? So because the x is negative, my origin we started over here, I'm gonna move that origin all the way forward along the x direction. So now my origin will be over here, okay? Represented by that red zero. If x and y were both negative, then I'll move this way and that way, right? I'll move along the x, along the y, and then my origin will now be over here and I'll do everything as this. So again, the number of ones that are negative here are the directions which move. If y and z were negative, I would move all the way across here for y and all the way to the top here for z to cancel that effect, okay? So everything we're gonna do is not gonna be in this unit. So, so we moved our origin, right? And then we do everything else the same, okay? So our x projection is negative one, our y projection is one half, as the projection is one, and that's our vector. So these two vectors are pretty are exactly the same. They represent the same crystallographic direction. This they would have the same number of atoms on them, and so on and so forth. Okay, so again, I encourage you to practice both of these methods. I teach you two methods so that you can use whichever one works best for you. And if you remember from the very first class, you have an online set of slides that you can sorry, no, no. Not an online set of slides, but you have um, an online, I would call it a program. Yeah, it's a website basically that you can go on and look at some of these things and see them in real time. So this will be some examples of vectors that you can actually practice with and draw them to see how they look, okay? So this screenshot that you're seeing here represents a one zero one over bar direction, okay? And in all those examples you see, um, you will notice that they're gonna draw additional unit cells. Again, different people, different strokes for different folks. I would just suggest that you do what works best for you. And the only way you know that is by practicing. All right. So we've talked about how to figure out um, directions. Okay. So how to figure out directions based on a sketch, or how to figure out the numbers, um, how, to, how to figure out the sketch based on the numbers. So you've done those two. The last part of this, as far as vectors are concerned, is figuring out how to calculate what is known as the linear density. Okay, so the linear density is given by the number of atoms on the vector divided by the length of the vector itself. Okay, so this is similar to your density that you used to calculate, right? Which density is mass over volume. And you can think of it being the number of atoms within that volume, which gives you your mass, divided by the amount of space in that volume, which is your volume, the amount of space in that box. Okay, so the linear density calculates the density on the line, the mass or the number of atoms specifically divided by the length of the um, direction. Okay, so we're gonna do that in the context of calculating what the linear density of aluminum in the one, one, zero direction is. And we're told that for aluminum, A is 0 0.405 newtons, okay? So if you look at this diagram, this kind of crystal structure is known as what? It is a face-centered crystal structure. Okay, it has a face-centered crystal structure because we have these positions in the face. And this one, one, zero direction here is that. Okay, I'm gonna save you some time there. So that's something that you would be expected to draw, for instance, on an assessment and then figure out what it is. All right, so we're gonna calculate the linear density of this, okay? So just think back to when we're doing densities or atomic packing factors we have to do quite a bit of geometry on this shape. So to find the length of this, we're gonna need um, some information. We're gonna need information about these size because typically when we're doing lengths, if we don't know the lengths, we can do 
what we call Pythagoras uh, theorem. Okay, there's an alternative way you would do this. Like if you're given the radius, for instance, you could actually use the radius, but we don't have the radius. All we have is the edge, so we're going to use this. Okay, so I'm going to take this projection here. Imagine you're looking at it from the top. If you were looking at it from the top, it would have that shape where my one one zero vector goes from this point here to this point over here. And the triangle I'm discussing is going to be this orange, these two orange lines. And so if I want to find this length, I'm going to do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And fortunately for us, a and b are the same. So my formula for my length looks something like the square root of a squared plus a squared, which is equal to the square root of 2a squared, which becomes the square root of 2 times a. Okay, so I skipped a step here, but if you do it on paper, you'll be able to see what that step is. So that takes care of the bottom part. That helps us figure out what the length of the vector is. What about the number of atoms centered on that vector? Okay, this one is a little tricky because if I look at this, I'll say, well, there are three atoms here, okay? But we're thinking of a vector, and a vector is a line. And because a vector is a line, we don't think about the number of circles we have. We think about the linear portion of those circles. And the linear descriptor for a circle is its diameter. So if I'm trying to figure out the number of atoms on the vector, what I do is I figure out how many diameters reside on that vector. Okay. So for instance, the whole of this circle Y lies on that vector. So I would say that is one full diameter. Therefore, that's one full atom. Half of X resides on that vector and half of Z resides on that vector. Both of those are half diameters. So I have a half diameter here. I have a half diameter there. One half plus one half gives me one. So I have one diameter plus this one diameter in the center, which gives me two. So the number of atoms here is based on the number of diameters on that vector, which are two. Two half diameters from X and Z and one full diameter from Y. So my numerator is two. My denominator is square root of two A. I end up with this expression and I know what A is. And therefore, I do 2 divided by the square root of 2a. I'm going to get 3.5 per nanometer. So that gives me the linear density based on this crystal structure and that information that I have. Okay, here's another exercise. All right, so now I ask you a question where I said the unit cell of a certain metallic compound, the atomic radius is that value, is shown. And the atomic radius is 0 0.134 nanometers. And the question is, what is the linear density of the vector that I drew? So the vector that I've drawn is one that goes from this end to this end. Again, I made an error here because I didn't give you um, the actual x, y, and z axis, but we're going to assume that this is the origin. Okay, Typically, I'm going to let you pick your own. But it doesn't matter here because I'm not asking you specifically what this direction is. Okay, So you're given this unit cell, right? And then you're given this formula, and then you're given these relationships that tell you about the radius and the edge. So part of what you would need to figure out or suss out, as we would say, is the kind of crystal structure that this is. So when you look at this picture, what kind of crystal structure does this represent? It is a body-centered crystal structure. And because it's a body-centered crystal structure, we're going to be really interested in this expression here, which relates my radius to my edge. And since we're given the radius, that will be something that will be important. So we have two parts of this expression, LD there representing the linear density. We need to find how many atoms are on the vector. And then we need to find the unit length, or the length specifically, of that vector. So let's take this information and just reproduce it. It looks something like that. So that's the um, relationship we're interested in because this is body-centered. That is my atomic radius, 0 0.134. And this would be me looking at that box from the top. So if I'm looking from the top, those would be the corners. These would be the corners of my square. And this would basically be the diagonal of that square, which is that. So I've denoted that with this um, letter L here. All right. So my expression is the number of atoms sending on the vector divided by the unit length of the directional vector. So let's start with the top. So I look at this, I see that half 
of this atom is going to be on this vector and half of this atom is going to be on the vector. That's it. So I have half a diameter here and half a diameter here. Okay, so that means my top part is going to be one half diameter plus one half diameter divided by L. So we know this top part is going to give us one. Okay, so that's what the number of atoms sent on the vector is one. But how do we figure out this L? So if you look at this, my L is part of this triangle, which is formed by the edge and edge. So L is going to be related to these two, and we can use Pythagoras for that. Okay, so you're going to see Pythagoras is really popular in finding these planes and these lines. So this is going to be edge squared plus edge squared equals L squared. And that gives me this expression. And then edge squared plus edge squared gives me two edge squared. And what is the edge? The edge is based on the crystal structure that we're given. And so my edge is going to be equal to 4R divided by square root of 3. So if you look at this question, even though you can say you might think it's a plug and chug, it really isn't because you would need to know what the crystal structure is to figure out what expression to use. So this is not simple cubic and it's not face under cubic. If you guessed one of those, you would have been wrong. So this is the edge and this 4 over square root of 3 is basically based on the relationship between R and edge. So I plug that in and so my L is going to be the square root of all of this. Square root of 2 gives me square root of 2. The square root of 4 over square root of 3 squared is that. And once we have that and the question we're told what R is, we end up with this expression where the top part is 1 because I have half a diameter and half a diameter. And the bottom part is just me replacing that with R, which is 0 0.134. If you work that out on your calculator, you should get something along these lines, which is 2.28 per nanometer.